Hello, welcome to EPG Patshala. Today in this module we are going to talk about evolution of environmental laws and regulations in India. Over the last three decades, India has witnessed the evolution of a number of environmental rules and regulations aiming towards the protection and improvement of the environment. Perhaps no other country in the world has as many environmental laws as we have in India. Most of these laws came into existence in the post-1970s period and by and large were driven by judicial activism and the role played by the Indian environmental movements and organizations. This module is an attempt to understand the evolution of environmental laws and regulations in India. This module begins by discussing the environmental discourse in India and how the discourse influenced the evolution of environmental rules and regulations and more importantly, the intervention of Indian judiciary in the protection and improvement of the environment. The second section gives an overview of environmental laws and their objectives. The reasons for ineffective implementation of laws are discussed in the third section. The fourth section outlines the role of the Indian judiciary and National Green Tribunal in environmental protection by highlighting selective judgments. Finally, the paper concludes by identifying the major challenge for environmental regulations in India and the possible ways to resolve them. Environmental debates in India. The word environment in India has different meanings for different sections of the society. This section argues that there are different perspectives on environment and these perspectives are framed, constructed and expressed by different groups from their social, cultural, material, religious, political and livelihood concerns. One of the major perspectives of environmental debate in India relates to the entitlement of different social groups to natural resources and also how their immediate livelihood depends on their use and management. It has long been argued by scholars that there is an intricate and direct relationship between the use and management of natural resources and the livelihoods of the majority of the people and that any change in this relationship might result in a number of environmental struggles. A majority of people in India are mainly dependent on the natural resources not only for their livelihood but also for their continued existence. Most of the environmental movements advocate the use and alternative use of as well as control over natural resources for the subsistence of people's livelihood options. Martinez Elliot calls these movements the environmentalism of poor to distinguish them from the Western environmentalism, which according to him is a product of empty. Affluence. Like Martinez Elliot and Ramchandra Guha, many scholars have argued that Indian environmentalism is different from Western environmentalism due to the emphasis on social justice and equity principles in its demand for sustainable use of resources. The above perspective on environment in India emphasizes that since a majority of the people, especially the poor farmers and tribal communities in India, are dependent on natural resources for their livelihood, they should have ready access to use and manage uh, natural resources on a sustainable basis. Thus, a major thrust of environmental debate in India is directed more towards the material interests of the environment as a source and a requirement for the livelihood rather than a concern with the rights of other species and of future generations of humans as a concern for today's poor humans. The recognition of people's rights to use and manage natural resources for the sustenance and livelihood would not only help address issues like equity and social justice, but also ensure social and cultural rights of people or natural resources. The participation and protest made by people to protect their immediate livelihood options from any kind of development or environmental degradation has been identified as environmentalism of poor. To quote Lele, the normative concerns of environmentalism of poor is directed more towards the equitable sharing of or access to natural resources, land, water or forests, with an additional social justice dimension that the livelihood needs of the poor must be given a higher priority than the profit aspirations of the rich or the corporate sector. Such an approach is evident in the Chipko movement, which was not so much about the preservation versus destruction of nature as about who should have the right to extract forest resources, rural communities or timber contractors." Unquote. Another perspective of environmental debates in India, however, points out that increased concern for environment in India is not always necessarily for material interest and that it can be for the non-material and intrinsic value of nature. 
Many scholars argue that human concern for preserving the quality of environment is directed towards seeking a change in the official policy for ensuring a healthy environment and emphasizing the fact that human beings are one among and equal to other species. They also argue that the struggle for preserving the quality of environment is quite different from the struggle for environmental protection for livelihood. First of all, many conservationists contend that nature has an intrinsic value in and of itself apart from its contribution to human well-being. They maintain that all created things are equal and that they should be considered as ends in themselves, having a right over their own habitat without human interference. They value biodiversity for its own sake and assign the rest of the nature an ethical status at least equal to that of human beings. Some even contend that the collective needs of non-human species and inanimate objects must take precedence over man's needs and desires. Animals, plants, species, rocks, land, water bodies and so forth are all said to possess intrinsic value in terms of their very existence irrespective of the relationship to human beings. These ideas have a significant measure of support both from the state and the middle class environmentalists in India in the form of wilderness movements. Conservation groups, mainly consisting of the middle class, advocate the preservation of biodiversity by preventing all human contact. In fact, such conventional environmentalism, as argued by Prasad, got reflected in the formation of national parks and sanctuaries with the aim of preserving wildlife and biodiversity in the post-colonial era. Although their earlier efforts were directed towards exclusively uh, the protection of large nomads, more recently animal activists and wildlife preservationists have used the scientific rhetoric of biological diversity and the moral arguments in favor of species equality in pursuit of a more extensive system of parks and sanctuaries and a total ban on human activity in the protected areas. In the recent years, animal rights activists and wildlife preservationists have strongly emphasized that there should not be any kind of human activity within the protected areas, wildlife reserves, parks and national sanctuaries. Many scholars have pointed out that this exclusionary conservationist paradigm of Indian environmentalism strongly advocates that the state play a dominant role in terms of taking all measures including policy initiatives towards the protection of endangered species and forest resources. Under this paradigm, the right the rights of human social groups, including those of the marginalized ones such as tribal communities or the rural poor, remain subservient to the rights of non-human species. Conservationists, by and large, encourage and welcome the efforts of the government of India towards establishing networks of protected areas that include all major ecosystems, even as social activists challenge the displacement of people from the protected areas. The number of people getting displaced due to conservation activities is difficult to determine, but estimates suggest the number in millions and it is clear that poor people pay a disproportionately high cost for conservation while receiving a few of its benefits. Writing from the perspective of environmentalism of poor in India, Ramchandra Guha, in his book in 1997, argues that conservation biologists and other conservation groups, particularly urban middle class, tourism lobby groups, forest departments, ruling elites and conservation organizations like Worldwide Fund for Nature and World Conservation Union IUCN, in their commitment to biocentrism and wilderness preservation have failed to recognize the importance and needs of humans. The strategy and campaign of conservation groups in blaming the poor and forest dwellers for the forest degradation or killing of tigers is also problematic as they often blame the forest dwellers and tribals as primitive and passive, failing to organize the active role uh, traditional ecological knowledge has played in the stable and effective forest management. Other scholars point out that the concern for preserving the quality of environment for enjoying a healthy environment comes from the middle class, which has no direct material interest in the environment. Their concern for environment stems from the fact that people have a basic right to live in a healthy environment, which they claim is non-negotiable and that it has to be ensured through the various policy initiatives, including scientific and technical measures. 
This perspective and strategy of middle class groups derive significantly from the issues employed by the dominant strand of environmentalism that emphasize the devolution of powers from the state to the community for sustainable use of resources for livelihood. Such kind of environmental activism has, however, been criticized by social scientists, most notably by the environmental sociologist and writer Amita Bhaskar, who sees closing down industries in the name of larger public interests as a strategy of middle class society along with various state and non-state actors, including the court, lawyers, bureaucrats and environmental activists, to decide how the environmental values of the city should be prioritized without recognizing the rights of the workers and predominantly missing the point. Many studies have pointed out that the pollution in Delhi was controlled due to an active judiciary and civil society organizations led by the middle class. But Amita's fundamental point about health conditions of workers and their basic rights to livelihoods ignored by the court and thereby served the interest of the middle class remains pertinent. The above perspective on environmental protection and improvement suggests that there are multiple concerns and reasons why people want to protect the environment and how it should be done. This perspective influenced to great extent in the evolution of Indian environmental laws and regulation and also the decisions of the Indian Supreme Court. For example, the National Forest Policy of 1988 for the the livelihood concerns of forest dwellers in the conservation of forests in India. Similarly, the Environmental Impact Notification of 1994 resulted after a long demand by environmental groups for people's involvement in the clearance process. Likewise, the Indian judiciary expanded the meaning of right to life to include right to environment as per the fundamental rights. The following section now gives an overview of environmental laws in India. Evolution of environmental laws in India over the last three decades, the Ministry of Environment and Forests of Government of India has enacted a number of environmental laws and also has restructured the environmental regulation process to ensure successful enforcement of environmental law in an effective manner. Across the country, government agencies wield vast powers to regulate industry, mines and other polluters to ensure the effective implementation of environmental laws and regulations. The process of environment regulation which started effectively in the early 1970s has subsequently become comprehensive and stronger in part by the state of fresh legislations passed after the Popal gas leak disaster of December 1984. They cover hitherto unregulated fields such as noise, vehicular emissions, hazardous waste, hazardous microorganisms, the transportation of toxic chemicals, coastal development and environmental impact assessment. Equally significant in the environmental regulation process is the creation of a number of regulatory structures to implement these laws effectively. The enactment of the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974 provided for the industrialization of institutionalization of pollution control machinery by establishing boards for prevention and control of pollution of water. These boards were entitled to initiate proceedings against the infringement of environmental law without waiting for the affected people. The Water Cess Act 1977 supplemented the Water Act by requiring specified industries to pay cess on their water consumption. With the passing of the Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981, the need was felt for an integrated approach to pollution control. The Water Pollution Control Boards were authorized to deal with air pollution as well and became Central Pollution Control Board and the State Pollution Control Boards. In view of the Stockholm Conference on Human Environment and growing awareness of environmental crisis in the country, India made an amendment to its constitution through incorporation of direct provisions for protection of environment. The Constitution 42nd Amendment Act 1976 makes it a fundamental duty to protect and improve the natural environment. Article 48A states, and I quote, the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard forests and wildlife of the country. Unquote. Corresponding to the obligation imposed on the state, Article 51A G, which occurs in Part 4A of the Constitution dealing with the fundamental duties, assigns a duty to every citizen of India. 
Article 51A G states, and I quote, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers and wildlife, and to have compassion for living creatures, unquote. Therefore, the constitution makes the twin provisions. This includes directing the state to protect and improve the environment, and also expecting citizens to help in the preservation of the natural environment. Similarly, in 1985, the Department of Environment was changed to the Ministry of Environment and Forests and was given greater powers. The Environment Protection Act 1986 was passed to act as an umbrella legislation. The act also vested powers with the central government to take all measures to control pollution and to protect the environment. The Environment Protection Rules 1986 were subsequently notified to facilitate the exercise of powers conferred on the boards by the Act. The EPA identifies the MOEF as the apex policy making body in the field of environmental protection. The MOEF acts through the CPCB and the SPCBs. The CPCB is a statutory organization and the nodal agency for pollution control. The EPA in 1986 and the amendments to the Air and Water Act in 1987 and 1988 furthered the ambit of the board's functions. Other major elements that have followed include Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981, the Air Act, Environment Protection Act 1986, the EPA, the Manufacture, Storage and Import of Hazardous Chemical Rules 1989, Hazardous Waste Management and Handling Rules 1989, the Manufacture, Use, Import, Export and Storage of Hazardous Microorganisms Rules, Genetically Engineered Organism or Cells Rules 1989, the Chemicals, Accident, Emergency Planning, Preparedness and Response Rules 1996, Biomedical Waste Management and Handling Rules 1998, the Municipal Solid Waste Management and Handling Rules 2000, Recycled Plastic Manufacture and Usage Rules 1999, Ozone Depleting Substances Regulation and Control Rules 2000, the Noise Pollution Regulation and Control Rules 2000, Batteries Management and Handling Rules 2001, the Public Liabilities Insurance Act 1991, the National Environmental Tribunal Act 1995, the National Environment Appellate Authority Act 1997, Biodiversity Protection Act 2002, National Environment Policy 2006, and at last the National Green Tribunal Act 2010. In this way, India has enacted a wide range of regulatory instruments for preserving and protecting its natural resources. Prior to 1970s, Pollution and environmental degradation had been addressed very generally in terms of nuisance, negligence, liability and a few principles for tort law. At present, there are stated to be over 200 central and state statutes having at least some concern for environmental protection, either directly or indirectly. Many of these acts and constitutional provisions attempt to provide effective solutions through different institutional mechanisms for dealing with environmental protections and preventing the degradation of environment. Apart from the measures of command and control embodied in the above acts and rules, the Government of India has, time to time, offered many economic activities for units endeavouring to control pollution. The scheme of EcoMark, introduced in 1991, operates on a national basis and provides accreditation and labelling for products which satisfy certain environmental criteria along with quality requirements of the Indian standards. Other incentives include rebate offered on water sales to units implementing pollution control measures and meeting the standards. Investment allowance to actual cost of the new machinery or plant which assists in controlling pollution, exemption, Indian indirect tax, income tax, etc. However, <coughs> The plethora of such enactments and constitutional provisions has not resulted in preventing environmental degradation in the country. The last three decades have witnessed a rapid degradation of the environment. The enactment of a number of laws, both by the central and state governments relating to environment, has not made much headway in controlling the depletion process and the laws by and large remain unenforced and or mismanaged. Further, despite the existence of a national environmental policy, the constitutional mandate of environmental protection, a flurry of legislations and administrative infrastructure for implementation, the problem of environmental degradation continues to remain a great concern in India and in fact 
has intensified over the years. An analysis of the impact of environmental laws at the implementation level suggests that the implementing agencies have adopted a soft attitude towards polluting industries and have done little more than issuing warnings. The reasons underlying this state of affairs appear varied and complex. However, one major fact seems to be ineffective implementation of the laws concerned. A number of academic studies have, document, have documented environmental compliance problems and challenges in India. These include compliance to environmental regulations, the Indian context by Karen Priyadarshini and Om Prakash K. Gupta in 2003. Environmental Compliance and Enforcement in India Rapid Assessment by OECD in 2006. Environmental Governance and Regulation in India by Atiya Karmali in 2002. Environmental Protection Role of Regulatory System in India by PM Prasad in 2006. Evaluation of Central Pollution Control Board by Indian Institute of Management Lucknow in 2002. And Turnaround Reform Agenda for India's Environmental Regulators by Center for Science and Environment in 2009. The functioning of state pollution control boards has also been reviewed by four committees or study groups. Viz Patachare Committee in 1984, Beliappa Committee in 1999, the Administrative Staff College of India Study of 1994, and Subgroup in 1994. These studies have primarily been done at the instance of state pollution control boards or central pollution control board. They, they highlighted into area the need for adequate financial backing and appointing powers to the boards, revising the categorization of industries, use of economic incentives, enhancement of awareness generation among the general people, environment protection and role of Indian judiciary. The Indian judiciary has played a significant role in the protection and environment of environment by <coughs> recognizing the right to a healthy environment as part of the fundamental right to life. Directing polluters to follow the environmental norms and regulations, ordering the implementing agencies to discharge the constitutional duties in terms of protecting and improving the environment, determining the quantum of compensation for the pollution affected people, taking so more to action against the polluter, entertaining petitions on behalf of the affected party and legitimate and inanimate objects, expanding the sphere of litigations, introduce, introducing environmental principles such as polluter pay principle, Precautionary principle, absolute liability and public trust doctrine for environmental safety and protection as well as the well being of people. The role of Indian judiciary in the environmental protection raises the question as to why there is a need for judicial activism in resolving disputes related to environmental problems. The reasons underlying this state of affairs appear varied and complex. However, one major factor seems to be the ineffective implementation of the laws concerned. Many legal and social science scholars widely agree that there is governance deficit in the field of environmental protection and improvement. This has prompted environmentalists and the people as well as non-governmental organizations to approach the courts, particularly the higher judiciary, for seeking suitable remedies. Interestingly, the judiciary has responded in a proactive manner to deal with these different environmental problems. Executive and the legislature play a major role in governance. The Indian experience, particularly in the context of environmental governance, is that the judiciary has begun to play a very important role in the, in the environmental governance process. The increasing intervention of the judiciary in terms of resolving environmental disputes has led to the emergence of a new phenomenon, courts of law in India as perhaps the sole dispenser of environmental justice. Through its intervention, the Supreme Court has emphasized the importance of the preservation of natural resources for multiple purposes while also observing that the increasing de destruction and degradation of natural resources would pose a serious threat to future generations. The Supreme Court has noticed that those national and state agencies responsible for environmental protection and its improvement have largely failed in their duties. In view of the national and state government's inaction, the Supreme Court's unusual assumption of legislative and executive power seems to be justified, especially in the context of India's increasing environmental problems. In many ways, the Supreme Court's aggressive stance towards environmental protection has had some positive effects. <coughs> India already has had environmental laws in place to protect environment from different 
activities, but due to several reasons, including the failure of implementing agencies, subcompetence, insufficient staffing, political interference, and corruption, the executive branch and its underlying agencies like MOEF and the regulatory bodies like pollution control boards have been prevented not only from enforcing policies but also adapting them to India's changing environmental needs. Hence, the Supreme Court's increasing intervention and its assumption of a wide range of powers has possibly reversed two ecologically dangerous trends an ineffective gov government and deterioration of natural resources. Although it hastens, although its hastiness has caused many predictable and perhaps avoidable effects, these efforts have in many ways benefited India's environment and thereby giving the civil society and environmental advocacy groups a renewed opportunity to fight for protecting and improving the environment in India. Emerging Trends The Role of National Green Tribunal In view of the criticism made against the increasing role of the judiciary in environmental matters, sidelining the current environmental structures and regulatory bodies and also the court's own expression to set up an independent environmental court in India, the Government of India has enacted the National Green Tribunal Act of 2010 to specifically deal with environmental litigations. The Green Tribunals, especially the National Green Tribunal functioning from Delhi, has been given enormous power and also consists of multidisciplinary background experts to deal with environmental litigations. The National Green Tribunal consisting of judicial and scientific experts is considered one of the long-awaited requirements to deal with a flurry of environmental litigations across the country. The inclusion of different experts to deal with different aspects of environmental problems on the National Green Tribunal will undoubtedly go beyond the cost-benefit considerations of a project or a production unit in addition to serving several long-term interests of the environment and development. The setting up of Green Tribunal can help petitioners bring local environmental problems to the notice of tribunal at a little cost while questioning the environmental impacts of government decisions. The new Green Tribunal has been empowered to adjudicate disputes relating to environmental protection. The Green Tribunal has the powers to declare as illegal and invalid any administrative action that contravenes or undermines environmental laws. Also, the Green Tribunal is empowered to review orders passed under all environmental protection laws including those that cover water, air, forest, and wildlife. No other court or authority can entertain any application, claim, or action that can be dealt with by the Green Tribunal. This would make government departments more cautious in clearing the projects with potential environmental impacts. An analysis of its role over the last four years suggests that the National Green Tribunal has been very active and progressive in its approach towards environmental protection in general and rights of marginalized people in particular. The National Green Tribunal has not only come down heavily against microstructures but has also shown its teeth against big corporate sectors and against both state and central government for not following environmental rules and regulations. For example, the Jeet Singh Kaur and Vinod Kumar Pandey versus Union of India and others case, the petitioners challenge the environmental clearance given to the proposal for installation and operation of a power plant proposed by Messrs. Dhiru Power Gen Private Limited. It was argued by the petitioners that the mandate of various guidelines in the public consultation process set out by Environmental Impact Assessment Notification dated 14th 9, 2006, issued by the MOEF, have not been complied with and even flouted while granting the environment clearance. The executive summary of EIA report in vernacular language as well as the full EIA report were not made available 30 days prior to the scheduled date of public hearing. The National Green Tribunal observed that by applying precautionary principle, the environment clearance should not have been granted by the MOEF and also emphasized that the economic interests shall be put in the backseat when it is found that degradation of the environment would be long-lasting and excessive. The court further pointed out that the input order of the MOEF granting environment clearance to set up the coal based thermal power plant as sought by the project proponent is illegal and liable to be quashed. 
It is, however, important that the Government of India lay down certain guidelines for the effective exercise of powers by the National Green Tribunal while dealing with environmental litigations. The decisions of National Green Tribunal and expert groups should be responded and implemented by all of the departments in an effective manner. If this happens, the National Green Tribunal's role will benefit India's long-term environmental regulation prospects. There should also be stringent guidelines in place for the appointment of expert members to the Green Tribunal based on suggestions of different environmental groups, legal experts, judges and academics. The entire process should not be carried out under a veil of secrecy and also it is necessary to ensure that it is amenable to public scrutiny and review by judicial bodies, preferably experts from different sections including scientists, technicians, judges and NGOs. Conclusion the above discussion suggests that there is no dearth of environmental laws and also how over the years environmental laws in India changed from centralization of resource management to involvement of people in the use and management of resources. However, due to increasing conflicts over the use and management of resources and the failure of state agencies has led to intervention of courts in resolving environmental problems. This has resulted in expanding and recognizing various social, social cultural and economic aspects of people in the protection and management of environment. Also, the process of environmental regulation has been closely scrutinized today by civil society groups who play a major part in ensuring the effective implementation of law. Nevertheless, there are a number of challenges which the current environmental regime in India faces these challenges include lack of strong financial, human and technical resources of pollution control boards at the state levels and increasing interference of state government in the affairs of state pollution control boards are the dominant factors of non-implementation of environmental laws at the implementation level. The most important challenge, however, is going to be how to sustain and empower the environmental regulatory authorities in the era of deregulation.